Friends, comrades, compatriots, I'm Jackie Fox, and I'm not always the most attentive member of my local DSA, but when I do show up, I try to take in some high-level ideas and bring them back to my audience. And this time, I brought back an hour-long lecture on Introduction to Socialism. We're going to start with Marx and then work it up past Marx into post-Marxist Marxism, all the way to post-Marxist Marxism, post-markets, and most certainly post-modern, Postmates delivery service, post-rational thought. Okay, so to, in order to get from Marx to Lenin, we have to trace the SPD, which is the German Social Democratic Party. Uh, very kind of underrated often. A lot of people kind of coming from the if you're like a Leninist or a Trotskyist or something, it's, off, it's kind of easy to say that the, the German Social Democrats were all a bunch of uh, softies. Uh, <coughs> uh, and everybody likes Rosa Luxemburg, of course. But um, they actually had a lot of you know, extremely amazing texts and writers um, and uh, definitely deserve credit where credit's due. So actually Marx and Engels were both members at its inception. Uh, the primary Marxist thinkers were Luxembourg, uh, Karl Kautsky, August Bebel, and Edward Bernstein. Uh, all of these, again, were on the Marxist side of the SPD. Um, there was a huge kind of right-wing contingent that was uh, kind of associated with the union movement in the SPD. And actually some of those people <coughs> become Nazis. Uh, so there's like a huge division. It was a, it was a huge party. Uh, and yeah, it was kind of, kind of an insane thing. But uh, Lenin mainly identified it with uh, Kautsky, and like even in Lenin's later writings, he talks, uh, basically uses Kautsky as uh, uh, a rhetorical position to argue against other communists. Um, but Kautsky, um, although it's commonly thought that he voted for war credits in World War I, he didn't because he couldn't vote for war credits, um, he stuck with the party of the SPD. And the SPD, along with every other socialist party, before 19... 14, or at, during 1914, joined with the bourgeois parties to fight World War I. And so this is why Rosa Luxemburg, in her famous Junius, uh, Junius pamphlet, says social democracy is a rotting corpse, uh, which is true. They, they had sided with the bourgeoisie against the proletariat and joined with, with, with what would become basically a mass slaughter for no reason. So social democracy is dead in 1914. It's long gone tradition in a lot of ways, uh, and it's kind of doesn't have a leg to stand on. Um, and it's within this space that you get uh, the Russian uh, socialists or social democrats who kind of want to do something new. Um, it's important to remember, Bolshevik means what? Majority? Majority, yes. Menshevik is minority. And the majority and minority of what? The Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. The Bolsheviks weren't communists until 1980, or 19, sorry, 1918. They're all social democrats. That's what they considered themselves. And Lenin's, all of Lenin's early writings, he's talking about, you know, to be a good social democrat and so on. So it was social democracy totally until 1918. That's when you have, like, communism. Uh, it's just kind of important to remember. Um, if when people make fun of us for being social democrats, it's not that fucking bad uh, of a thing to call us, you know, but I don't know. It, it's just a, it's a hairy historical situation, you know what I mean? It's like, like Rosa Luxemburg was a social democrat. It just doesn't really make sense as a, like, whatever. Okay, August Bebel, an amazing German social democrat, amazing writer. We aim in the domain of politics at republicanism, in the domain of economics at socialism, and in the domain of what is called religion at atheism. So, real deal. Uh, yeah, and as I've kind of already said, the Social Democratic parties, because of their massive right-wing contingent, join the bourgeois parties, fight in World War I, and lose all credibility, basically. Um, it is important to mention that Kautsky, August Bebel, Rosa Luxemburg, even Edward Bernstein, none of them ended up waiting, waiting it out. They ended up leaving the party uh, during World War I because they were just so disgusted with it. Kautsky would end up rejoining, but by then he was kind of like, uh, he'd kind of joined the other side, so to speak. <coughs> um, so yeah, Lenin, 
develops some new ideas. One of them is called uh, revolutionary defeatism. So he says, while you are fighting your imperialist war, the Russians are going to say, let's bring the war home. And this is an, kind of an incredible new stance. So we're not fighting this war, we're taking the war home and uh, basically fighting against our own bourgeois. Uh, got the revival of the common state as an idea and uh, a concept of, of the imperialist Leviathan state. This is something that comes out in Nikolai Bukharin's work. Uh, all of these are kind of theoretical new ideas coming out of Russian social democracy that would end up creating the first uh, successful communist revolution. Um, Lenin obviously wrote a lot of stuff, imperialism, uh, why German social democracy failed, I think that's Trotsky. Uh, so, I mean, everything was kind of up in the air, basically. Uh, so, the Bolsheviks take power, 1917. They were very popular among the Petrograd workers, especially. It wasn't really a coup. Uh, it was a genuine popular workers' movement. Uh, they weren't that popular with the peasants, but so on. Uh, so, again, this is one of the big problems, is that like 80% of, uh, of the Russian economy was peasants. So, could you say it was premature revolution? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but that was something that they were immediately going to have to deal with. Uh, the Bolshevik has inherited a war-torn nation. Four years of constant fighting, brink of starvation. Uh, even Russian, like, kind of proto-fascists, their solution was nationalizing more of the economy and putting it under military control. So, kind of a, a truly chaotic place. The Bolsheviks immediately were isolated, uh, but they also anticipated a German revolution. Uh, and a German revolution would have basically given them an, an industrial power, um, and they could have... The idea was to kind of, you know, have a kind of permanent revolution starting in Russia, moving on. This didn't really pan out. Um, so they were isolated economically with a bunch of peasants <coughs> in a country that had been in four years of war um, and immediately invaded by like two dozen armies, including the United States, Britain, France, Germany, um, and fought a, another four years of an extremely, extremely brutal civil war. Uh, a majority of the working class died in that war. Um, so when they came back uh, from the Civil War, they're actually presiding over a smaller ratio of proletarians to peasants than they were before. Um, and the Civil War created mass, uh, of course, death from war, famine, starvation. Uh, it was like syphilis outbreaks and shit. Um, just a total mess. It also made the party basically authoritarian. Um, so, you know, if you're in the Civil War fighting for existential, kind of, you know, the life of the Soviet government, um, yeah, they just kind of did what they had to do. But they set a lot of bad precedents, and it was, they were never able to get, kind of get back to democracy after doing this, uh, not in any kind of meaningful way. Um, yeah. So, Bolshevik economic policy. Initially, the very first thing that they wanted to do is uh, workers control, Soviet democracy, commune state. Um, it was kind of a failure. Um, as it turns out, you can't just hand over factories to people who've been fighting in a war for four years um, and all of a sudden things just work out smoothly. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was just it was kind of a failure. There was no real plan. Uh, no one really knew what to make. It's kind of a disaster. And so Lenin said, okay, we're going to have to normalize economic relations kind of towards capitalism again. And so he came up with this thing called state capitalism, in which the bourgeois would be reinvited into the factories. Um, <clears throat> this was kind of seen as the first big betrayal of the revolution. But in order to destabilize the economy in, in any sort of way, it was probably necessary. But it was rejected, and they didn't even have to do it because then they were thrown into the Civil War, uh, which lasted until 1921, along with war communism, which is what it was called. Uh, war communism is basically everything that conservatives think communism is. Um, if, like during the Civil War and during war communism, if any one of us was like suspected of, of hoarding grain, that was a bullet. End of story. You can, you know, you can see like tons of letters like this. Uh, we found some gulags <coughs> like uh, hoarding grain. You know, kill them all and kill a couple more just to you know teach them a lesson. War communism was fucking brutal. Uh, 
everybody basically worked like slaves, and that was it. Everybody had rations. I mean, it was like rough, 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 rough. Um, and so after the Civil War, there had to be some kind of return to a system which wasn't extremely brutal. Um, for some reason, a lot of the Bolsheviks thought war communism could have been prolonged. Trotsky was famous terrorism and communism, was a you know, uh, kind of portrait of war communism. Uh, which you know, he basically said, oh, actually this is really good. We should continue these really brutal policies. Uh, it was like kind of his lowest moment, very embarrassing. Stalin kept a copy of Terrorism and Communism well-worn on his desk until he died, uh, supposedly like using it as a guidebook, uh, very creepy. Um, Bukharin, uh, also, um, Economics of the Transition, uh, supported war communism, everybody did. But it was unsustainable, it had to be scrapped. Basically, you can't literally hold a gun to people's head and have them work for the rest of their life. So we enter into the new economic policy, which is basically a way to breathe life into the Soviet um, economy. So here we come to the crossroads of the, of the commune state. <clears throat> the commune state just simply couldn't be um, done. It was just somewhat too idealistic for the situation. Um, but because there was no real alternative, the commune state basically just became a party state. Um, so a lot of the czarist bureaucracy was essentially just kind of maintained. The state was never really smashed as Lenin wanted it to be. Um, the police and army couldn't really be abolished. They tried that, didn't work. Uh, German imperial soldiers are much better than factory workers when it comes to uh, fighting war. So they had to reconvene uh, an army uh, police force. Um, <coughs> Also, there was an issue of, if you were a specialist, you would want to get paid more. Um, and there's only so many specialists that you can kill before you realize that you have to pay them more money in order for them to do the work. So there was already a stratification within the state of um, like monetary incentives. And so that's kind of the emergence of bureaucracy, or the red bureaucracy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, yeah. I guess we kind of already talked about this. War communism, very, very bad, very brutal. Um, and you think, like, the Bolsheviks did a lot of terrible things during war communism. The whites were way worse, let me tell you. Uh, like if, you know, <clears throat> if I was in the white army, army and I showed up to this uh, meeting and I saw that some of you had calluses on your hands where you've been holding hammers, that's a bullet. Because you're a worker, and workers um, are sympathetic to the Reds, so you get killed. Shit like that, constantly. Pogroms. Uh, insane amounts of violence. Uh, and the peasants ended up siding with the Reds primarily because the Bolsheviks said, look, once this is all over with and you side with us, we're killing your landlords and you get your land. Uh, <clears throat> the White Army says, if you side with us, um, your landlord's sticking around and it's just going to be right back the way it was, if not worse. So peasants um, realized that, okay, we like being in more control of our land uh, than we did when the Tsar was around. So why would we do that? Um, and there's some like really brutal stories of like peasants killing white army officers and stuff. Uh, it's like almost comically brutal, but yeah, extremely bad period of time. Um, quick uh, content warning. I think there is a couple of dead bodies coming up. So if you, I should have mentioned that before I already showed some dead bodies, but here's some more. Not this, but this, yeah. Uh, Here's a kind of a picture of war communism and the Civil War. <clears throat> As you can see, the middle peasants are selling um, are selling what looks to be their child, uh, who had died but contained still enough flesh to be eaten. Um, yeah, it was fucking bad. There's no glorification of this of this period um, whatsoever. A lot of people died, um, and this is partially why you have. Bolsheviks and a couple of kind of friends and all of these people um, who don't want to see a successful communist state uh, created. Um, so yeah, you can kind of just take that for what it's worth. And here is some Bolshevik art, uh, Egalian Trotsky writing to pro proletarian success, and here's some white army uh, propaganda, which um, yes, is very anti-Semitic, if you, you know, can't pick that up. Uh, the White Army, big into killing Jewish people. Uh, that was one of their big things. So, 
Also, an, another th th thing to point out, point out especially uh, the Bolsheviks signed a treaty in 1918, the Treaty of Brest Litovsk. Uh, it was like kind of considered a big betrayal because it ceded a lot of land to the Germans, but it was basically the last ditch effort to end World War I. Um, this also had a huge effect with the kind of, uh, kind of greater authoritarianism um, of the Bolshevik party because a lot of the um, like left SRs who had previously been in government started a terrorism campaign and just started killing Bolsheviks, including trying to kill Lenin. Uh, that happened a couple times and then the Bolsheviks were like, uh, you know, fuck you guys. Uh, like we're not letting you back into our state. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you're, not, you're no longer allowed to be a part of the ruling party if you're going to kill us because we did something you didn't like. Um, so this is kind of the beginning of the process of the one-party state. Uh, there's actually a really good account. So Bukharin, who's like my favorite, Nikolai Bukharin, was on his way to give a speech about how the government should not repress anarchists. And uh, there was a bomb on the uh, train that was planted by an anarchist that nearly killed him. Like, did kill, I think, like 20-odd people. And again, enough instances of that, and then like you just stop saying that we should repress anarchists. So that's the reason. And I'm not saying it's good, but that's the reason. Um, yeah, a lot of heroic art from everywhere. I mean, the Civil War was huge. It's you know reached the entire uh, like former Tsarist Empire. So it's not just a European affair. <coughs> Some Red Guards uh, doing dress up. Okay, after the Civil War, again, brutal, brutal, brutal. Uh, democracy was just not considered an option, not workers' democracy, because most of the workers, again, had died. And so the idea was just scrapping together what we could and kind of hunkering down and trying to regularize production enough that like, more people didn't die in mass. Um, so that led to the, the new economic policy. It was mostly traced out by Lenin's last writings in 1921 and then taken up by Nikola, uh, Nikolai Bukharin. And basically, it's like a mixed market economy. The, State would own all the industrial businesses, um, but a lot of concessions were made to the uh, peasants, and the peasants would uh, produce on their own accord and sell to the market. And the idea was roughly that the state would offer the peasants cheaper credit and cheap industrial goods so that <coughs> there would be more rapid turnover within state uh, firms, and that the peasants, through satisfying their own self-interest, would actually be establishing the communist economy, uh, slowly but surely. And this kind of worked for uh, a while, 